Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ace Space, the volleyball podcast brought to you by CEV, where every week we get to know a star of the game. Um, who do we see? I'm terrible at this. Who do we introduce first? Do we introduce our special guest or the other presenter? Thomas, uh, you choose. Definitely the guest. Definitely you guys first, and you build up to like guest. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. Uh, in which case, spoiler alert, not that it was already written in the title, but we do have a great guest today. But before that, in the big seat, Key Michael, how are you? The big seat? Yeah. I'm big? Well, I'm great. I'm so happy to be here. This is my second official podcast conversation. I feel I'm getting, I'm getting used to it. I'm getting comfortable. I'm not sweating quite as much. And uh, yeah, all good. <laughs> And our special guest, drum roll, please. <laughs> Pol- I nearly said Poland International. They have messed it up already. Uh, going into your fourth season in Poland, Belgian International. We are delighted you could join us. Thomas Rousseau, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, where in the world are you, Thomas? I'm actually in my uh, own apartment right now uh, that I had... Uh, like since i guess may or something so uh it's brand new i have my own place uh in belgium brussels um oh beautiful happy city to be happy to be at home yeah really Most amazing city, city in the world <laughs> Oh, that, I tell you what, that's a big call, but uh, but yeah, it is pretty awesome. Also, we release these podcasts as a video now every Wednesday, and uh, I make sure that I've got my little bit of foliage, but your place looks really clean, man. The fans are going to oh, love yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Plants, yeah. I got some plants everywhere. Uh, my girlfriend is also very, in, uh, she's a big plant mom, you know. So. Oh, yes. House plants make all the difference in an apartment, right? You, yeah, you, yeah, like, yeah. And, you inhale I mean, the corona, oxygen. Corona like hit us and we got a little, like bored and we went a little over the top. You know? <laughs> Twenty plants to uh, feed and water and do and yeah. I'm That's on nice. board with that. In my backyard too. <laughs> So we've got you for three episodes, Thomas, which is super exciting. And we are looking to cover a lot of ground in that time. You'll be fed up of talking to us by the end. Um, but, but let's start with, um, with Brussels then. You're, you're back there. How does it feel to, to be home and spend some time there these days? It feels pretty amazing. It always feels amazing to be at home and because I just, you know, I have a very... A very nice home situation in my opinion uh belgium is so small my family's so close i have all my friends close um so yeah i was also very excited with the new apartment uh coming back after the season um, to my own place you know because before i was still living with my parents um but then yeah corona uh like hit us and it was kind of like you know expectations were sky high also like you know we're going to be able to do all these things and you know go to these concerts and festivals and this and that and yeah then that didn't happen so uh it was it was interesting but still i was just happy to be with my partner in the apartment and we just focused on uh furniture and like you know um you know making it at home here you know so and i saw some videos of you guys doing some yoga recently Is oh, that, yeah. uh, are you into that or are you forced to be um, into that yeah yeah i i am uh, definitely into that but i would say it's because of her mm-hmm. uh, my my girlfriend is american by the way she uh, oh, cool. she's um, a professional dancer um, wow. who's looking for a job in like contemporary and ballet dance uh, which is not happening right now because the culture sector is uh, completely dead for the moment if any listeners out there have any pointers Ah, or anyone that you you know (laughs) hire her send Thomas a message (laughs) and so she also does yoga and stuff and um yeah it's just great to keep your yourself fit because at some point also we couldn't even go out Mm. of the apartment uh and then we just you know had to like be creative inside the apartment and now we have this these uh weekly uh sessions kind of in like a park uh, close to like my apartment where like my sister, my mom, some friends and stuff come over and I always have to join and we like, she's our teacher and then she like gives us a uh, yoga classes. So you do all like family yoga all together. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's cool. so awesome. And it's great for volleyball. I mean, I started because I had a lot of back pains at some point. I started mm-hmm. just stretching and stuff and it just got way better. Also my like hip mobility and flexibility got better and stuff. So yeah, I'm all into that um, stuff. 
I you need do to it, start Kate. doing yoga then. I, 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 I wake up with back pain ev- almost every day since the season ended. Yeah. More so than when I was playing volleyball. So I think maybe yeah. I need to get into we some yoga I, as well. I get out of bed sometimes and I'm like, such an old man. Yes. <laughs> I just gotta try to touch my toes and just like, you know. Yeah. Uh, now you've not been playing for a little while. Has it affected your your weight? Because I'm always fascinated by um, the sort of difference that between athletes' bodies and normal humans being human beings' bodies. Because athletes are also human <laughs> beings, Dave. Well, just, you're not just, you're not regular not human beings. I, I spoke to <laughs> I spoke to your um, Belgian teammate Sam Duro a couple of times in in the past few months, yeah. and he was saying that he actually lost a few kilos yeah, yeah, having yeah. not played. Whereas you know, if a, a recreational player like me, if I didn't play, I would almost definitely gain kilos. Yeah, um, yeah. How has yeah. it been for you? That's true. That's true. Yeah, and Sam is definitely like in his very healthy phase and stuff right now. So he like he it's true that for example, me, I also lost weight because your muscle, like you know, you have so much more muscle when you're constantly working out and uh, you know, practicing and stuff. Um, that's true. Um, so I definitely lost a lot of muscle. Um, also because I don't have weights here or anything, and I mean, mostly we need more explosive things or more like strength, uh like practices um and i didn't have that and obviously also it's like you know you eat different because you're not in your uh you're not in a competition so i definitely like you gain fat which is normal because you know in, in the season sometimes i was around like six percent seven percent which is really like playoff what? percentages mm-hmm. you know you are super skinny but you're also very sensitive to getting sick and stuff and then after the season i just like yeah gain some more fat and lose some more and lose some muscle. But I think that's kind of normal in a sense because, you know, your, your, your body isn't used to or made for like what we're doing during the season, the whole, your whole life, you know? So it's kind of more like accepting your body as well, because you're so used to like having like, you know, a very fit body and stuff. And then you kind of see changing and you see your belly button getting a little like more. (laughs) (laughs) more Um, But it, it's all it's all good, I think. Like you know, I I can't complain, and um, I'm sure like once we'll start again, like I'll get that muscle back. I'll be sore for three weeks. But, you know. Yeah, your body is used to it. After you've been doing it so long, it just bounces back. I think. I think so yeah. quickly. Yeah. yeah, I'm not worried. You know, just you just have to want to work hard, of course. You know, in in the weight room or something, and I, which which I like. Then you get the muscle back, and then you get the strength back, and then it's all good. I think. You said 6% there. I think if anyone was referring to me in 6%, it would probably be like percentage of winning hits or something like that. It certainly <laughs> wouldn't be body fat. Um, so we've got you for three episodes and you've mentioned your family a few times already, which is great because I was hoping in episode number one to talk about it because it's not very often in professional sport you get the success story of you and your father and your sister and before we pressed record you were you were saying that uh, that your brother was a setter as yeah. well i i yeah. didn't know that yeah. so let's start at the very beginning then because it would be easy to make the assumption that when you were all growing up your your dad had played pro and he was coaching at a top level and obviously it was a big part of your life but but how much do you remember about sort of your really formative years as a as a young child and volleyball? Was it a massive part of being a youngster? Well, um, first of all, my mom was also a volleyball player. Uh, she was in the national team of Belgium as well. Uh, and so my father as well. Uh, my father was also, as a player, uh, got the like best player of Belgium, uh, best player of the year award and stuff. So like, yeah, big family. I have a brother as well, the oldest one. Uh, who was also a setter, um, but he, you know, just had other interests, and he's a firefighter now. Wow. Uh, um, so, yeah, my first memory, I'd say, is, um, so I was too young to play volleyball because I was, like, four or five years old, and um, my, but my brother and my sister were playing, and they were playing in this club team that my father was uh, kind of uh, – yeah, he was a coach there, but or like the head coach or something. You'd say like he would uh, give practices to different age categories, etc. And it was kind of his club team in a sense. 
And, uh, but I always had to get, uh, like, go along because after school, like, you know, we, we, we both, um, all three of us went to the same school. Uh, and then after we had our activities and they were like practicing where my father was the coach and I just had to wait there, you know, and just wait for the practice to be over. And I was such an energetic kid and I was always like, you know, wanting to join and this and that. And I remember going up to my dad once and he, um, I asked him like, dad, how do you, how do you spike? Like, you know, how do you spike the ball? And, uh, and then he showed me, um, uh, but like he's right-handed and I'm actually left-handed. But he didn't think that I was left-handed, so I like he taught me how to do it, and I kept doing it with right, and I'm spiking with right now, you know. And if he would have let me spike with left, or he would have thought about it, maybe I would be like an amazing left-handed I don't know, setter or something, or yeah. <laughs> no. But and that was kind of like my first memory, like waiting there for my brother and my sister to finish the practices, and I just you know got so into it and wanted to join that at uh, one point my dad caved and he let me like join and. He said it was such a, a pleasure to see me, and he said I did really well. Like uh, that I was very uh, good, like my attitude and stuff, because I was kind of like a crazy kid when I was younger. Uh, so from then <laughs> on, he just uh, he let me play, and and that's where it started. Yeah. Wow, Interesting, wait. you say he let you play. I, I, most people that I know that are coaches and parents, they can't wait for their kids to join in, yeah. and they, that that's all they can think about is I can't wait until he or but she is a volleyball is, player. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, like, my parents are physical educators, so that's their job, like, you know, um, or their, that was their stu uh, study direction, I guess. Right. Um, so they're, like, they didn't want us to necessarily play volleyball, uh, because I also played three years of soccer, for example. Um, so they were really, like, we want them to make the choice, uh, like, doing whatever they want. I did, like, before I did some judo, I did some other stuff like they let us try a lot of things out before yeah. actually like uh letting us play volleyball because they were like we don't want to be those kind of parents where like you gotta play volleyball you gotta be like that you know i wonder if that's why you love it so much you and your mm -hmm. sister and you're so actually willing to work hard and go far because you chose it you chose it for yourself right i mean i feel them. i feel like i do like i said our older brother he doesn't play anymore and that's fine like it's like some people have this uh idea about our family that you know you have to play volleyball or we're all like we're at the dinner table talking about volleyball <laughs> you know? but there's so many dinners and whatever that like volleyball isn't even mentioned once you know yeah so mm. that's just a little bit like um i think the outside world thinks we are really completely all volleyball and we had to do it because of our parents or something but that's actually not the reality um so yeah yeah that's kind but, of my i guess that's my answer i hope it's not too uh no <laughs> that's that's perfect that's just what uh, just what we were after actually because one's only got to take a look at your personal instagram to see that you are an incredibly close family and it seems like you've got a lot of support for each other and uh, uh, a lot of love for each other one thing that i did find interesting with with you and your sister is that you played in Italy in the same year and you played in Poland sort of from 2017 onwards. Was that coincidence or was that a deliberate thing? Like the, the fact that she was also playing there? Or? Yeah, yeah. Obviously different, different teams and different cities, yeah. but you seem to be in the same countries at the same time. Yeah. Like when I was... Uh, uh, I was playing three years in, in Belgium, uh, so really close as well. So that was for us, like Peter Verhees was also playing in Monza with me, another Belgian player. And we were like, we just had our little group like around Milan, which was uh, amazing. Like to have your, like I have a good connection with my sister, of course. So it was good to have her uh, with me. And then, yeah, I saw like, um, oh, I can go to Poland and yeah, then uh, also was in Poland. So that was, that was just great. You know, it worked out well even if we weren't uh, close necessarily, like uh, playing close to each other. Um, it's still nicer to feel like, you know, you have your, uh, your sister there or you have some like support or whatever family. And then I signed with uh, Resovia and she was already like playing in that like city, like for the women's team. And I was so like hoping that she would stay there as well, because that would have been amazing, you know, like 
playing in the same city with your uh, with your sister and then for the for the parents even to visit and stuff um yeah but it didn't happen but i'm always uh yeah our, our lives kind of seem to intertwine a little you know now she's signed in korea and they were also like always like i oh, also have a brother you know and then like uh he should also come and this and that I was like, it's always kind of like a like a family thing i guess yeah well you're lucky because you're both at the level that you can make those kind of decisions and you can take into account that you want to be close or you know certain teams will look at both of you yeah also- maybe yeah <laughs> That's true. That's true. We, we, I feel very grateful for that. Um, for sure. It's not that I'm looking necessarily like to go to a team close to her or something, but uh, I'm definitely like grateful for having the chance to even be in a completely different part of the world or another country close to a sibling like, uh, like my sister, you know? Yeah. That's pretty cool. It all seems very supportive and very kind of free and, and lovey and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> were you ever or are you and your sister competitive with each other with each other uh i would say yeah i would say so i would say so um but more like when we were younger i guess because now we don't like more in sports and stuff for sure and i was definitely like a big bully in the family like <laughs> <laughs> really crazy sometimes uh but um now not not really because you know you like grow up and then um you just don't see each other that often anymore so there's also way less i guess possibility for annoyance or something or for (laughs) competitiveness or whatever you know so So you've gotten closer over the years you'd say oh yeah i feel like that's the way it was really close but um maybe i matured a little (laughs) because (laughs) always like you know the um, how to say, yeah, I was sometimes just a little bit like, yeah, annoying. It was like my way of showing her love or something, teasing her a little and stuff. Uh, so in that sense, we were like kind of competitive when we were like doing something and like, you know, on each other's back or something, but in the most positive way, actually. So, yeah. Hey, of all the people you've met in volleyball over the years, in terms of p- players you've played with, played against, yeah. coaches, friends you've made, have you ever met anyone less likely to be a bully than Thomas Russo? <laughs> <laughs> I know, actually, actually, I have to say, as I was re- doing my research for this podcast, I did, I sort of put the feelers out. I sort of asked around some people say, oh, you know, what, do you know anything about Thomas or Helen or their father? And I have a quote for you. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thomas is really funny, very outgoing, fun to be around. So you'll be really comfortable. Oh, wow. So now, <laughs> yeah. now are we playing are we playing a guessing game? Do you think no, to, I'm okay. I'm gonna keep them I gotta keep my sources all okay. Anonymous. Journalist secrets. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah, I, 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 I would say that's how I would describe you now that I've met you for five minutes. <laughs> so you're very funny outgoing and <laughs> yeah. I mean I, I kinda um, feel like I have this um this this image uh, or this label, I guess, in volleyball of being a very positive guy. Um, and, and yeah, you're, like I like to smile and during the games as well. Um, but that's not all, I guess, not like, you know, that's not all there is about volleyball. You know, sometimes you also have to be, sometimes I am also demanding or competitive or not constantly positive, you know. Or know if someone that, pushes your buttons. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I should talk about it on the podcast, but I also saw a video on Facebook of a little scuffle through the net a couple of years oh, ago. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That yeah. must have brought like, out the like, worst. For example, like like that in Poland, um, it's a different culture than I'm used to. Like in Belgium, for example, a uh, different country and also a different style of playing, um, but also on an emotional level. For example, players are very, I would describe it very manly in a sense very uh-huh. aggressive sometimes uh in in that like in that sense not that being manly is aggressive but in okay, in that uh, aspect they are They're trying like, to sort of show so, the and then you have like my style of playing is maybe a little more um more focusing on you know like enjoying the game because i love to play the game and and you know smiling and stuff and celebrating and, and having more fun and winning or something in that sense then for them they they thing that's not like a characteristic of a strong person or something you know so sometimes you have to stand up for yourself as well 
for uh, sure it can be misperceived or even with coaches it can be sometimes um something like oh thomas is a very good guy a very positive nice guy or something and it makes it easier for them sometimes to maybe pick another player over you for example those are things i learned also throughout my mm. career um being who i am and i'm not going to change who i am but i also need to face the reality that sometimes you know in other there's other people as well and you got to stand up for yourself and you got to show a different side for yourself as well you know than 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 just a smiling uh, positive guy or something you know how easy was that to do then uh, early in your career when you when you signed for and i'm so sorry is it rosolare is that yeah, the correct rosolare you can pronounce it with okay. uh, with your R, I'm trying to teach my girlfriend some uh, Flemish, and I just said like, drop the R, trying to use R. Just uh, I, R. I can do the R. So I'm I'm from Wales, okay. and okay. we've got oh, some R's in us. In okay. fact, I I didn't yeah. I didn't want to I didn't want to bring it up, but I watched a replay of one of my favourite football matches of all time from the European Championships in 2016 when Wales beat Belgium 3-1 in the quarter. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a, what a great game, honestly. <laughs> he had to throw that in, Thomas, didn't he? <laughs> right? Well, the, th the thing is key, going into those championships, I thought Belgium were going to win the Euros in 2016. They had such a good team. Yeah. And Wales was just this ramshackle bunch of sort of journeyman footballers with Gareth Bale. Yeah, and and uh, Ramsey, or something. Ramsey, yeah, Ramsey and Bale just carried the team and it was amazing. Um, and yeah, Belgium, Belgium went one... I, I Sorry? don't remember. I... <laughs> <laughs> Belgium it's went not burned into your memory. No, Be no, Belgium, no. Belgium went 1-0 up with one of the best goals of the entire tournament. And then somehow, out of nowhere, Wales, Wales won the game. But anyway, moving swiftly yeah, yeah. on. Um, so, <laughs> Rus um, yeah. So, they, they were your first professional club. And, of course, your father was the coach. So, how, yeah. how was that as a dynamic obviously he yeah. wouldn't have signed you if he didn't think you were uh, you were yeah. good enough and you certainly were good enough but people talk yeah yeah good question um because before so in this club team when i was younger he was always my coach as well mm -hmm. and then i went to the volleyball school and a lot of belgian players i think like 90 percent of the national team is like went to this volleyball school um so it's like a big thing he was my my uh coach as well there and then he signed with Russelaar and I finished volleyball school so I was I was about to sign my first professional contract and um and in that time I had a couple of offers from like in that time it was Antwerp it was Mazek um it was Russelaar and Lenik and those were like the, the big four like really like good teams and Antwerp was really nice and I really like liked Antwerp actually, and I was talking with them. I was talking with Mazek, um, and then yeah, my father signed with Russelaere, but I didn't even talk to Russelaere, or I didn't even have in my mind, oh, I would play there. And then he signed there, and um, and I still wasn't like, oh, then I'm gonna sign there, you know, because my father is there. Because I honestly said like I already had a lot of years with him, <laughs> uh, but he said like, listen, Thomas, like this is like my idea of the team. This is my idea of what I'm like gonna try to do with this club and stuff and besides the fact that you are my son I really think I see a really important uh, place for you in this project and then yeah I just honestly like I signed but it wasn't because like oh uh, my father is there now it just it made a lot of sense and then you know I went there with this young group um, and we we won the championship and we won the cup and we won the super cup and my father was coach of the year and I was rookie of the year and uh, it was MVP of the of the year so it worked out great like you know and they had really a couple of bad years just before my father came so it was like I was so happy about my decision you know yeah I bet you were it, Perfect it, it couldn't have gone any better really oh, it was we literally won everything there was to win so you're saying you regret it all. It was a terrible yeah, decision. Terrible. <laughs> no, it was the right, it was the right call. Even yeah. if it wasn't always easy, like I, I didn't play like the first uh, part of the season because I was the rookie, you know, and I had to really fight myself into the team. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I did it, obviously. So my dad also didn't give it on a silver uh, platter then. Um, but yeah, I was, was crazy happy. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And I wonder if he was more aware as a coach and you were more aware as a player 
um, it's uh, obviously you were both you were both highly professional about it. But in those periods of time where you weren't necessarily getting the court time that you thought you could because yeah. you were a rookie, did that frustrate you at all? Did you feel as though you might have been benched because your father didn't want to show any favoritism? Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. Because I remember like uh, one conversation with him where I really had to like sit down and say like. Hey, Emil, you gotta, you gotta risk it. You gotta try to play me. I feel like I'm ready, and I feel like I'm showing that I'm really ready and practicing hard. And um, he was never protecting me in the sense of like, um, you know, doing like less, like being less hard on me than on other players. He was always harder on me, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and he was protecting me in that sense that he was a little scared. Like, yeah, if he fails, then you know it's also me because you know he's my uh, I'm the coach and he's my son and this and that. So I felt like he was kind of like being a chicken about it sometimes. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, you it, called it, him out. I, I sat I sat down with him and I in a good way. Obviously, I told him like I feel like I'm ready and I feel like you should really uh, try it and I want to give you the sil signal that I'm really ready or something you know and then yeah I kind of felt like that was a good uh, a good change like you know even with with every every coach um, it's always difficult to communicate in a sense as a player because there's always kind of like you know coach player um, but it's it's always good to communicate with your coach and it's also hard even if it's your dad to communicate with your coach sometimes so I was happy I did it and it, it kind of changed uh, something for me there. You called him Emil there. Do you call him Emil in volleyball and dad out of volleyball? No, I always call him Emil or okay. like a nickname or something. I, I don't know. Because What's we, his we, nickname? <laughs> we call him the Miller. It's like the Miller. <laughs> because before, and also in practices, even when we were really young and you like wanted his attention and you were like, Papa, like Papa, he wasn't listening to you. So you had to go like, Papa, Papa, Emil. Like this, you know, because he's like always with his head in the clouds or something or thinking about this or that. So I just like like that and I always call him Emil. Yeah. Interesting. It would also be a little weird, you know, if, if he would be playing in a team and you'd be like, Dad. <laughs> Dad. <laughs> Did it make it more difficult to leave then? Because you went to Italy after three very successful years. Yeah. Was that a tough thing to do? No, it was... I, I looked forward to it because um, for me, Italy was, had always been my dream to play in Italy as a young, uh, as a young kid and to play abroad, first of all. Um, so when I had the chance, I also had the three years in Uruslaer and I was really done being the son of the coach. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm really, I'm out of here because it doesn't matter. Like if you play, you can only play a perfect game, but nobody plays a perfect game. And if you don't play a perfect game, you're, uh, you're like, mm. Oh yeah, it's his, uh, it's his son or something. So I was kind of like fed up with that. Even if we were winning everything, I was like, yeah, what is yeah. some people's problem? Like, <laughs> and so do you I think, like, yeah, sorry. Sorry, do you think he was stricter on you than he was on the other players? Because I've heard from my quote that he's quite a strict coach as it is. Yeah. Do you think he was even harder on you? I mean, sometimes uh, he definitely was, or most, yeah, he definitely was. And some, it's, it's hard, you know, as a, with your father as a coach, sometimes you take, um, it's difficult to always change um, what happens on practice and what happens like after, you know, you need to make to a separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to separate it, exactly. And sometimes it's hard because with your dad, there's an emotional connection as well. So if he's yeah. like crazy hard on you and he, um, yeah, like made you suffer in a sense, like physically and, and like it's difficult to, after separated after practice and stuff so that makes it really hard sometimes um but on practices i'm happy he always pushed me harder in a sense or he was more strict on me because it would be unfair and it would put me in a in a weird situation if he would be uh less hard on me i'd feel uncomfortable you know because then you give people the reason to say oh his son is like you know he yeah. gets this and that. he gets priority yeah yeah. Can you think of an instance where, because you mentioned there, um, sometimes it would sort of boil over after practice. Can you yeah. think of an instance yeah. where that yeah. happened? <laughs> Multiple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Like, and one year I was in volleyball school, but I wasn't staying in, at the boarding school. I was always uh, going home after the practice. 
So you have like, you have a school uh, part, which is like four hours of school, for example, in a, uh, in a volleyball school. And then after you go back to this, uh, it's called the Euro Volley Center, where the boarding school's at, where the practice facilities are and stuff. And then you work out, you have weights, you have uh, tactical uh, video sessions, you have uh, ball practice and stuff. And then after, normally you stay in the boarding school, but I was going home uh, with him. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we had a huge fight and then we were in the car, in the car together driving home like half an hour, 40 minutes or something. And just like, no word, you know, just, like being so pissed as a, <laughs> a young boy or something. And then, yeah, my mom was there as a mediator, you know, <laughs> and the food, when the food, like when we arrived home and you saw all the like delicious food on the table, like everything was fine again and we're all happy. <laughs> This idea of the volleyball school is so interesting to me because I've heard it from a lot of Belgian players, but I haven't heard it from any other country that does this starting yeah. in high school. Yeah. That you do half. Yeah. So can you explain it to... I mean, we're just... such a, a small country. So, you know, for us, it only made sense to, you know, we have to, from a young age, start practicing really hard. You know, we were like practicing 20 up. hours a week, you know, which is a lot for a young body. So. Um, but but it was our only chance if we wanted to like be any good you know on the international level and i think there's a couple of generations that have uh that have shown the results of it you know now uh we have a more established national team our youth like uh is doing better and stuff so it's i, I think it was great it's just a little bit like you know it's a lot it's hard mm. and it's not for everyone you know um are there you, players that go oh, through the system and then don't go play pro or don't no, go to the national team? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, you know, the best, uh, we were, we won the bronze medal of the junior European championship in Poland in 2016 or something. And the best okay. setter of the tournament was our setter. He doesn't like, he plays like in the third league now in Belgium or something. He is the guy who like, for example, I called for painting my apartment. He's just like, he's playing a part and stuff. Uh -huh. And then you hear that this guy, he was best setter of Europe in this junior category, you know, for example. Yeah. And that's just crazy. And then, then you just, yeah, it, I think as a player, it's, it's a decision you have to make, you know, at, after the volleyball school, when you have a professional contract, am I going to go for it? Or yeah. am I not going to go for it? You know, am, am I going to study or do something else? And that's also a lot of players, uh, they just decide to study or something, you know. By the looks of things, he has done a very good job painting the apartment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, really did. so um, you went to the volleyball school. Did your brother and your sister also go? Yeah. Okay. Um, and whilst you were there, was turning pro always the thing that was at the forefront of your mind? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because, and, I mean, I mean it's, it's a serious commitment, you know, mm -hmm. I... I feel like um, I was going to the school before here in Brussels, a normal school. And, you know, I, it was so nice, you know, just like kind of uh, after you go to the volleyball school, you can't have those um, first parties or, uh, I don't know, Boy Scouts or things you're doing, like, you know, just like other stuff. And like even because you commit to this volleyball and you're staying there and like five days of the seven and you're just exhausted in the weekends and stuff. So you give up on a lot of things that like, uh, other people have you know and then some are probably after this like uh five uh sorry four years in the volleyball school when they're like 17 years old they're like i want to go study now i want to have this like social uh thing i want to party i want to which is fine as well you know but it's mm. yeah you have to make a lot of decisions to actually get there you know and also for a young player in belgium sorry i'm almost uh no 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 this is this is great stuff i just uh, i just yeah. was, I had a thought but please carry on but so for, um, for a young player, unfortunately in Belgium, there's only, like I said, three, four teams that work professionally. So the, the rest, they can play at because the four teams have better players as well. So the young players, or they go to these clubs where they don't work professionally and they even practice like three or four times a week, which, which is not enough if you're still a young player, you know, and they don't have weight sessions, for example. It's just not professional. So it is also hard if you don't get into one of those top teams and then there's another thing you have to play because you know if you want to improve you have to play uh so it's also really hard and you have to make sacrifices for it um 
And yeah, I can understand that some players were like, yeah, you know, they get out, off of track because the system is not making it easier for you to, uh, to reach the top level or something. You know? So is that essentially what happened with your brother then? Oh, see ya. Uh, no, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. That's enough. <laughs> Lovely podcast. Uh, dro- <laughs> tell you about the school. Drop the mics here. Um, so, so that's what happened with your with your brother. Then he was the kind of was he the first? You did say he was the eldest of you all, right? Yeah. yeah. So he was the first on that pathway. Yeah. And he decided love yeah, this game, was, but yeah. not that much. Yeah, he was like, uh, and he was playing in a team that wasn't that professional, and um, you know, they. Don't or, or or you study and you're able to combine it with volleyball, or you earn decent money from volleyball, but you commit to it 100%. You know, and this team, for example, there's some teams that say, okay, we want to be professional as well, but they cannot have the financial means to support it, and then it's also hard, you know, because then you're giving up a lot. So I can understand you have to be like really kind of talented in a sense, I guess already in the first place, but also mostly like have a certain mindset where you really say, I'm willing to make sacrifices and maybe even like, you know, uh, suck it up for one year or something like not earning that much or something mm. or two years to actually like after hopefully if, if everything works out, go abroad or something and, you know, play on the higher levels or in the highest leagues. So it's funny important. hearing you say go abroad because what go abroad for me is like my parents are in the states going abroad is you know six yeah. hours time difference for you it's like whoop, just drive across the border uh, uh, yeah i mean <laughs> europe is small yeah yeah <laughs> you know? how important do you think then um just to close that off now do you think your sister turning pro was to you because, you know, two, two elder siblings, one did, one didn't. Do yeah. you think she sort of showed the pathway for you and showed that it was possible? Or do you think you'd have been fully committed to going that way anyway? Um, I think I would have been committed uh, anyways because yeah, I had the, um, we say like the microbe. We say like I really, I really uh, liked playing volleyball at like 10 years old or something. I was able to like start spiking better and then because if you can't like let's let's be honest if you can't play volleyball that well it's also for a lot of people not that fun you know mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a technical sport it's difficult but uh, so for me it was also I was like oh I like soccer I love soccer and then I started being able to spike harder and stuff and then it got really cool you know and then I was like totally hooked and uh, all the YouTube videos watching and this and that and yeah so I think yeah Helen, of course, it's nice to see like, oh, my sister's doing this, but it wasn't like, oh, I want to do it because of her. You know? mm-hmm. It's also speaking, different. Sorry. Yeah. Speaking of YouTube, I heard from a little birdie that your sister makes YouTube videos. She makes vlogs of when she's oh, traveling yeah. with the team. Yeah. yeah. That Sometimes is so awesome. That. Yeah. Because, you know, like playing abroad, sometimes uh, you have some free time when you have to I don't know, rest your body after practices and stuff. Uh, yeah. She, she really, uh, she really enjoyed that. Sometimes making videos of her friends and stuff and kind of like something creative, but they're pretty cool. Like you should check them out. Like they're. Actually yeah. Cool I saw fun. a couple of them. I saw one where she was with, I mean, she had sort of a selfie stick and probably a GoPro or something on the end. Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. And yeah. she did everything in reverse in black and white. Do you know which one I'm yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah. 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 That was yeah, so she cool. A, she a for that. I also really liked them. And it's just something, I don't know, she started doing it. And I was like, oh. And all her friends know her for that as well. When there's like yeah. weddings or something, like uh, Lisa Van Ecke got married to about uh, twice months. And then they had like a little video, a montage or something. And it's also Elaine who made it, you know, because they're like, ah, Elan, you're good with that stuff. Do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love hearing about athletes who do creative things outside of volleyball because it's, it's, for me, that's more interesting than to talk about the the championships or the medals or, you know, the trainings. I'm sort of like, what else do you do? Like, I really wanted to ask you, I mean, I asked you about the yoga already, but I saw some guitars, some electric guitars in the background. Yeah. Are you a player? I don't know if you see it. So I'm a bit of a guitar nerd. Talk to me. What are you? Uh, <laughs> what are you playing? Are you any good? Are you well, acoustic? First are you electric? Of all, I'm not that good. You know, I started yeah. uh, playing guitar when I was in Katowice, so that was like 
two years ago I started playing it. Um, but I have a Fender, uh, a Stratocaster, Ooh. and then oh, I have yeah. a, just like an acoustic Fender here. Oh, nice. Uh, so you have three guitars. I have a, a, a ukulele I got from my sister. Actually. There's a ukulele <laughs> there, and there's like a, an acoustic, and then there's an electric. Wow. Uh, but I, I'm like, I'm a huge music guy. Like, so I have my record player. Um, with, Amazing. Uh, there in my wall unit. But, uh, oh, cool. I'm, I, uh, yeah, I'm a huge music guy. Like everything that, that's like music history and like, um, you know, like 60s, big 60s, 70s. Like I'm so fascinated. I watch all these documentaries about it and stuff. And music theory, I'm like, you know, I like to produce some music. Um, I'm also studying event management, music and entertainment. So yeah, I just, oh, nice. uh, outside of volleyball, like when I come back from practice, yeah, I just like, kind of like uh, learn to play the guitar and stuff, you know, so. Well, the correct wow. number of guitars that one should own is N plus one. So keep, keep on <laughs> collecting. Um, in, terms of, in terms of documentaries, I'll have to edit this from the podcast because no one wants to hear about the music documentaries. Um, have, you watched, <laughs> have you watched Sound City? Yeah, from, oh, the, right, from Dave Grohl. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so good. Yeah. So, so good. And um, while we're here, so uh, Key, have you watched... Have you done your homework yet? No. <laughs> He's going to kill me. They keep asking me every single week. They say, have so, you seen The Last Dance? Surely you've seen oh it, Thomas. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, I'm really into filmography as well and making videos. And they're like, you have to watch this. It's the so, best sports documentary of all time. Yeah, so yeah, she's a professional athlete and a filmmaker. <laughs> and she's refusing to watch The Last Dance. I mean, filmmaker. what? <laughs> 10 out of 10, literally yeah. 10 out of 10. Is it? Wow. Yeah, I, I keep telling myself that I'll watch it on my flight home because I don't want to, I'll get distracted. I'm very, I, I'll get addicted and I'll, I'll spend all of my hours yeah. just watching yeah. it. Just yeah, get, really get I'm going to download it and watch it on the flight home. Bombs, like, oh. Good. Uh, right, what else do we have to do in this podcast, Key? Uh, we spoke a little bit about your sister, Tomas. Yeah. Do you want to hear the quote that I... Oh, um, you've quote gathered and we've... I've we've been gathering quotes. That's all on. I do for... <laughs> you've done like, some <laughs> properly legitimate investigative, investigative journalism and I just... And yeah, yeah. Matt, Matt was like, look, you're going to have to do a bit of stalking. I was like, whoa, okay. Here we go. <laughs> all right. So I want to see if you agree with this. Yeah. What I really admire her for is her extreme work attitude. There's nobody I know that works harder for what she wants. Yeah, that's a nice one. That's a really nice yeah. one. But she is really like, oh, she makes you feel bad like in Corona times because she's working out every single day like and finding <laughs> ways to work out with weights. And yeah, she is, um, she, that's very true. Like really nice attitude. And um, she has a lot of, like she already had a lot of injuries. So she has to take really good care of her body. And like when she's mm -hmm. fit, she played amazing seasons so far, uh, but a lot of seasons also she had something like, you know, a little surgery here or this or that. So she is also, I think, physically like really for sure, like, oh, she's on, uh, on point, you know, on yeah. top of things. So a nice quote. Wow, we're getting a lot of compliments. <laughs> They're all anonymous though, because I don't I want like anyone to you know, feel like they have to say. Sorry? I like her journalism. Like she does a uh, yeah, research, man. Research, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's the only I get. You know, I'm going on Wikipedia and finding all the all the stats, and I'm like, what else can I? You know, I need that something extra. Inside <laughs> story. I've I've gone through down to like 2011 of your Facebook page. Don't worry, I know everything. Holy moly! <laughs> <laughs> Actually, speaking of, I saw on your Facebook page that you. Um, ask for people to donate to Greenpeace for your birthday. And I thought that was yeah. so cool. Yeah, mm. basically nobody donated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you got like, like 300 yeah. euros or something. Yeah. Anyone's was, listening ooh. and feels like donating to Greenpeace. Yeah, because it, like Facebook gives you this possibility like to do it. And I was like, mm -hmm. great. And I'm all about like, uh, you know, yeah, climate change and stuff. Like I, yeah. I was like, yeah, this is still the, our biggest uh, problem in this world, even right now. Uh, okay, no. mm -hmm. Corona and stuff, but so I was like, yeah, let's do it. Like you know, let's uh, save the environment. <laughs> and then like I guess I raised like ninety euros or something or ninety dollars or, and I put like as a goal like five hundred <laughs> or something. No, and when I, I looked at it, it was like three hundred euros. 
What? Something like that. I think it was about 300 euros when I looked at it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe it was a little more. Yeah. Maybe I put yeah. like, some money in there. Oh, yeah. I, was like, I invited everyone. I was like, you jerks. Like, nobody. Like, <laughs> really, uh, um, speaking of stalking you on social media, I saw <laughs> a lovely picture of you and your godchild as well. Yep. Yeah. I'm Elise, uh, the sister of my brother, my oldest brother. Yeah. Oh, nice. Our newest, uh, member in the Russo family serious question and this is perhaps the most serious question we've asked you in the entirety of this podcast who's the best Rousseau player <laughs> holy <laughs> shit sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hold on. if I were you I'd just say the baby that was just born because I don't want to, <laughs> I wouldn't want to offend anyone I'm always on the, sitting on the fence on those kind of things well I guess like I guess my you know I, okay, my, my dad never went abroad as a player, even mm-hmm. when he could, like, he didn't do it because he met my mom, etc. But I think after the season my sister played, I would have to say my sister. And after where she's going now, Korea and stuff, yeah. like, you know, pretty amazing. She, yeah. she played, like, one of her best seasons so far. So I would have to give it to her, you know. But, you know, it can still change. You never know. Now, Key, do you think he means that or do you think he's just saying it <laughs> publicly? Uh, I think he genuinely means it. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do. Like, I mean, <laughs> it would have been different if I would have like, you know, if, if I'm like, wow, played. I think I, I also count seasons, you know, you always have like better. And, and I had like last season, like the season before the one that we had now was like, I played amazing. I played so like my best season so far. So maybe in that situation, I would have been like, you know, super full of confidence and uh, saying cocky, like, yeah, it's me, you know, <laughs> now it's, yeah, now it's my sister. Or, yeah. But sure. it goes back and forth. There's yeah. We're just going to have to check in with you flow. at the end of every season to see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. I think that is a nice place to, to wrap this, to wrap this opening episode, Thomas. Thank you so much. And key. Can you stop showing me up with all this great invest investigative journalism, please? <laughs> Goodness me. I'm supposed to be the pro here. Um, just just finally, Thomas, any any thoughts on episode one? Are you gonna drop out of two and three now, or can we look forward to welcoming you back? Of course, of course. It was fun. It was yeah, fun. Good man. Good man. You're and just asking me questions and I'm just answering the questions, like getting all the attention, like seriously, like who doesn't who <laughs> In the next episode, you should ask really Dave questions. Honest. See what you can get out of him. Yeah, feel, feel free. Um, so I think we've, uh, we've talked about the Russo family. In future episodes, we are going to find out about the Belgian team. I'm particularly looking forward to whether or not you know the answer. Why you are called the... I keep saying the Red Devils because I support Manchester United. I'm such a bad man. <laughs> why you're called the Red Dragons, which again, I should know because that's what they call Wales. Uh, and why the women are the Yellow Tigers and much more detail than that. And also, I'm looking forward to talking about playing in Poland because for a Brit, the first time you experience a Polish atmosphere it is like the most positive punch in the face you're ever likely yeah. to receive positive punch in the face what kind oh, of analogy it, is that because because it is like a punch in the face but you're like actually that's all right <laughs> <laughs> oh key uh, it is not just the a space podcast that you do what else do you do for cev and when can people listen to it <laughs> what else do i do for CEV? scripted together and it comes yeah but that's that's part of the a space oh jesus wet (laughs) all right (laughs) yeah sorry no yet we are dave and i and matt we do unscripted episodes that come out every friday so listen up people and hashtag let volleyball talk if you want to get involved if you want us to talk about some things yes uh yeah that's perfect and the podcast comes out on monday the video on wednesday and then the unscripted with myself key and matt on friday like subscribe tell your friends write us a review and we'll bring you more great episodes like this one with thomas russo but until next time goodbye bye everyone bye